Uh, we know that bone actually helps buffer dietary acid load, although the exact magnitude of this effect is a little bit unclear. In petri dishes, osteoclasts tend to break down more bone in an acidic environment, and osteoblasts lay down less bone uh, in an acidic environment. Um, however, it's worth noting that when we eat more protein, our, our urine does contain more calcium, but it also um, probably contains more calcium because we're absorbing more in the gut. Um, and if you look at acidic foods, they tend to be things like meat, eggs, dairy, rice, and alcohol, and alkaline foods tend to be most fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. And it's also worth noting that most of us are fortunate enough to have, to have kidneys that work well, and our kidneys um, do most of the work when it comes to buffering our blood pH. So um, as long as our kidneys are functioning, we shouldn't run into too many problems with dietary acid load. And if we look at a systematic review of all, this, all the data on alkaline diets for bone health, that's what we see. We see no clear relationship between dietary acid load and fracture risk or bone density as long as we've got functioning kidneys. So an alkaline diets just a waste of time. Another point of contention came a few years ago in the form of the supernova study. So this was a study done on 30 world-class race walkers who were brought into study over a period of several weeks. And during this study, they were split into a standard high, high carbohydrate diet, which is more the standard athletic diet, I guess, and a low carb intervention group with equivalent calories. So at the start and at the end of the three and a half week period, they measured markers of bone resorption, formation, and overall bone metabolism. So we can see the protein intake was relatively matched between the two groups, although maybe a little bit more protein for the high carb group, but the major difference was the carbohydrate and the fat content of the two diets. At the end of the study, the low carb group showed fairly significant rises in CTX, along with reductions in P1, NP and osteocalcin. And all this combined suggests a shift in the low carb group to less bone formation and more bone breakdown. So the study authors concluded that a low carb diet is potentially dangerous for bone health in the long term. Now, before I touched on the importance of certain minerals when it comes to building bone matrix, and you can see here that some of these are listed here. And if you look through the appendix of the study to see the nutritional breakdown of both diets, you'll see that the low carb group had lower quantities of all of these minerals. So these two groups were unfortunately not adequately matched when it comes to these. So this could potentially explain some of the, the markers looking worse. But that's not where the issues ended. So this study was only done for three and a half weeks. So that's far too short to determine long term exercise capacity. The athletes were not fat adapted going into it, and many people in this room can attest to the fact that it takes a bit longer for your um, body to adapt to, to running on fat if you're an athlete. And also many people in the room, room can attest to what can happen uh, when it comes to keto flu if you don't get your electrolytes right uh, in the first week or so of the diet. The athletes were not explicitly advised to increase their sodium intake, which can help mitigate some of these effects of the keto flu. Um, and above all else, the study didn't actually produce any hard outcomes. So nobody got a fracture, nobody got their bone density measured. Um, and obviously there's a good reason for that because it's already hard enough to get so many world-class athletes together in one place. But I think it just needs to be something we're mindful of that this data is not necessarily something we can just transfer to the average person and tell them that they're gonna have long-term uh, impact on their bones. So putting it all together in the clinic, this is our framework to proactively manage bone health in our patients. We will suggest a baseline bone density in patients at risk or when they turn 50. Nutritional assessments done on all of our patients with a particular focus to protein intake, micronutrients, fatty acids, and very diligent attention to their electrolytes. We'll use supplements if appropriate, so calcium, vitamin K2, D3, and a protein supplement if it's needed, although we'd rather patients eat their protein. Any abnormal inflammation or malabsorption markers need to be addressed and followed up because that can be a big driver of malnutrition in the long term. And this talk has mainly touched on diet, but just a quick point that resistance training is a really big part of getting people to build appropriate bones. So we'll often get people to work with our exercise physiologist or their trainer if they've got someone who can put them through an appropriate program. And finally, follow-up bone density measurements and body composition scanning is um, something that's quite easy to do because a DEXA scan is a cheap and very low radiation dose scan. So it lends itself well to regular follow-up, which helps you individualize your approach.